I don't have a facilitator this afternoon, so I'm it, which is fine with me. So this afternoon, Jay, if I could have everybody's attention. I know, I'm kind of like a teacher. Sorry, I wasn't. This afternoon, we're, we're going to talk about fire issues, and in particular, fire policy and fuel treatments. And for those of you that have just joined us this afternoon, we, this is our second day. And it hasn't been a particularly large crowd, but actually I'm happy about that. And that is because we have all uh, very high level people in the room. And that makes the um, discussion more to the point and we have a variety of perspectives. So I just ask everybody to be um, you know, professional and polite in their questions and answers. We are videotaping this and that will be available on the web. I have an interactive exercise that we did yesterday, and I don't think we're going to try to do that today, but we'll, we'll see how things go, and if there is time later, that's optional. We may finish early, and that's okay, too. So I'm going to be your first speaker today, and I'm going to talk about the ecological integrity of ecosystems, Fire, old growth forests, and owls, and the new forest plan revision planning rule. Should we manage for one species at a time? And I'm not sure what kind of owl this is. We can ask Ryan later. But we've tended to do that on federal lands. And we've tended to try to manage for uh, owls in particular and looked at different types of fire and fire effects and measured them all in response to this one individual. And as I mentioned this morning, when we do that, we're not even exactly sure what kind of fires are good or bad for owls. We certainly know that when there's a high proportion of owl uh, protected activity centers that are affected by owls, such as in the north on the plumas, that there may be some, some things we have to look at more in detail. Certainly if it's a very high severity uniform fire, that's not necessarily going to be, that people may agree that's not a good thing. But mixed severity, we still don't know very much. I'm going to talk about, at the end of this, why don't we know so much and why is it so hard it shouldn't be? And Mark Stanley and I have some simple answers. So where am I coming from? I was there on these fires. I've been on the fire behavior assessment team for eight years that I created. Um, fire behavior technical specialist, fire effects monitoring, and old growth forest expert. I've been to a lot of fires. I've majored a lot of fires all around the country. Now what I'm showing here are some results from a post-fire assessment that my old enterprise team, Adaptive Management Services Enterprise team did on the Moonlight Fire. We did something similar on the Antelope Fire. And what we compared here and did some rigorous statistical analysis of was land status. What is the difference in post-fire effects between protected activity centers for owl and goshawks treated and untreated parts of the landscape. And in this case, we have not distinguished what kind of treatment that, could, that was. That could be commercial harvest, it could be fuel treatment. And on the antelope fire, I actually did a statistical comparison of these different types of treatments, but I'm not gonna talk about there, that today. What we, we used two sets of data, field plot data, where we went in on the ground and collected data, and then remote sensing. Jay talked about some of that type of data. The interesting thing is, is or the useful thing about the remote sensing is, while sometimes I, I tend to um, have less confidence in it, it does allow you to look at much more of the landscape. And there's, you know, there's only limited time and money to go out on the ground. And there were similar findings for both, although the, the remote sensing had something more to say about the owl and goshawk habitat. And on the left graph, the middle black line is the mean or the median value. I 
forgot to ask my staff which was which, but that's okay. I think it's the median. And the top of the gray bar is the 25th percentile, or excuse me, the 75th percentile, and the bottom the 25th. And what we found here was that there was a significant difference between treated and untreated areas in terms of post-fire severity. And with treated and then with the remote sensing, there was even more distinction here. So that, and interestingly with the goshawk and owl habitat, it had a pretty low mean value, but it had a very high range of severities. With the treated, it had a very low um, mean value of effect, meaning mortality percent crown tree, percent change in, in tree crowns, the mortality of the crowns. And the untreated, it was more an average of 70%. With the remote sensing data, there's a greater distinction where you can see that the um, treated, uh, the, excuse me, the packs and the core areas had a very high level of tree mortality. And this is when we sample hundreds and thousands of points here. You can see the sample is 299. 268 for the owl areas, untreated 296, recent fire 99, and treated 207, because you can randomly pick these uh, pixels. And the recent fire in the treated had the lowest level of effect, and it was significantly different. The treated versus untreated packs and core areas were significant. So. Old growth forest is not magic. It doesn't have magically different fire behavior. Is it, um, do we need to treat in the way it was treated here? I don't know if we always do, but we need to start looking at this more because there are effects to what we do out there and just walking around and looking at it is important. Now, uh, Justin brought up a very good point earlier is we also need to track and see exactly what the owls are doing or using over the long period of time. And I would say owls are not the only thing. Now what happened on the chips fire? Here's what's to come. This is the um, precipitation patterns for the year uh, for a weather station near there. And the dotted black line in the middle is the average annual precipitation. And last year was the pink line just below that. Wasn't all that bad. <coughs> precipitation wasn't that uh, lower, much lower than average. What was very low was the live and dead fuel moistures. And this is just an example for Manzanita, where the uh, average is the green dotted line. And the last year, the blue line, I didn't have anything when the fire was actually burning, shows the trend there. It was going very low. And I was there on that fire tracking those moistures, and they were very, very low. So that means what we saw in the Moonlight and Antelope Fire, what we saw in McNally Fire, it's not necessarily what's going to be in the future. It's drier. And what that means to fire behavior, it becomes more explosive. And I say that from having specialized in measuring explosive fires as well as low intensity fires. And this is not to say that all fires will be that way. Brent Skaggs on the Sequoia has done an excellent job in managing the um, energy release components within which he manages fire in the wilderness and the current plateau. And he's done a very effective job of managing those. So it's not all good or bad. Even with these changing conditions, it is possible to do that. And Jay brought this up before, and I, I'm just going to reiterate it. The bare, the burned area severity for soils is not the same as vegetation severity. It tends to be lower. So this is from the Chips fire. This comes out as moderate on the soil severity layer in the background there. That's high for owls. Those trees may still have needles on them, but they're not going to live. And I'm one that gives these trees much more chance than anybody else does of possibly coming back. So what are our options? This is what I keep saying, and, and I, I, I'm not trying to be radical. It's, it's what I truly believe we have to do to affect 
differences in fire behavior. And, and this fits very well with what Sue Britting has brought up of with, with the fire deficits as well. I believe that the pace and scale needs to be increased, probably more than most of you do. At least one half montane productive landscape, preferably two thirds, whether it's mechanical, prescribed burn, managed fire, doesn't matter. Mechanical under burning, use them all. Now, what about effects to owls and other old forest components? I'm very disappointed that the owl scientists still cannot tell us after many, many years of the demographic study area, definitively what kinds of treatments and how fire affects owls. And during the 2001 EIS, I finally took the bull by the horns myself. And luckily I had good leaders can't constantly let me do this. And I said, I'm gonna go back and do the old fashioned thing. I'm gonna take the facts database for treatments from the forest lands on the Lassen. I'm going to go to the um, timber harvest plants for private land. I put them all together and I came up with an integrated treatment data set for 10 years and I went back and I did photo interpretation, old fashioned, and I included large tree density because we can do it. So what's, what that was able to be used for was Jennifer Blakesley, one of the owl scientists, for a PhD to look at owl relationships. And right now, the scientists are trying to use remote sensing and change detection to look at changes from treatments across the owl demographic study areas, but you know, the remote sensing is not very good at getting at what's on the ground. So the interagency fire group that I talked about, and Mark Stanley was uh, very instrumental in this before he retired from CAL FIRE, uh, we are working on trying to implement as fast as we can an interagency unified uh, treatment database that covers all lands and includes what's done by the Fire Safe Council and the counties and on private lands so that we can actually answer these questions. And I propose that the L scientists go back and do the old fashioned treatment because otherwise we're, we're never answering this question. So obviously I feel pretty passionate about this and that's okay because that's the way I am. So with that, We're going to save the questions till later, and if I mispronounce anybody's names, please accept my apologies. Our next speaker is uh, Dan Tomaszewski, the Vice President for Sierra Pacific Industries. And if it's okay with you, uh, can you, you can all hear me, so I'll just sit here. Except for if we want to, so that we can get, get me later. Okay, thank you. This or this. Okay, this one's fine. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some specific recent lessons we've learned uh, with some recent fires. You think it's on? It's on. There it is. Now it's on. Now it's on. No? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> uh, some specific lessons, um, particularly the Ponderosa fire, which you're all familiar with. Uh, that fire, you know, started in conditions that, as Joanne described, that are, you know, very low 100-hour fuels, uh, you know, tough, uh, very low uh, relative humidities. Uh, high temperatures and then steady 30 mile an hour winds out of the southwest. So, uh, d despite the fact that we had uh, done a lot of work out there on on uh, uh, land that we inherited from past owners, and there was a lot of even age units as well as a lot of thinnings and things, when the conditions are right, and this is a lesson we all know, that the fire will blow through any sort of vegetation management scheme that you have at least for a while. Now it slows down and spread and it allowed the agencies to, to use some of those places as anchor points, and it also allowed them to get in place to protect Shingletown and all the residents on the north end of the fire on Highway 44. So it had a real purpose there. But, it, but in the right conditions, uh, you know, fires are gonna blow through uh, your best efforts. That's one small lesson. But, but we also had an opportunity out there because when the fire burned, uh, we were, our, our research scientist, Cajun James, had been doing some work with Dr. Lee McDonald, who's now a professor emeritus, I think, in Colorado State, a very well-known hydrologist. He was in grad school at Cal when I was there. 
And uh, they were, they're, they're doing a lot of long-term monitoring the Battle Creek watershed, and this, is a, these, uh, this fire was in some of the trips to that. So what we wanted to do was measure sediment transport based on various treatments out there right after the fire. So you've got to get out there quick before the first rains, and that's a tough thing to do unless you're lucky enough to have the, you know, the ability to move quickly with resources. So we set up a series with Lee of sediment traps out there where we did some different treatments. And the sediment traps are V-shaped fences, essentially about this tall, and they're maybe 15, 20 feet wide in a triangular shape, and they're designed to catch the sediment that runs off once we get the rains. And we did several treatments. One was uh, no treatment at all, no harvesting, just no nothing. Uh, the second was we did salvage logging on the merchantable timber and left all of the fuzz and the brush and everything, recognizing that this place is completely burned up, so you're leaving little black whips and things like that. It's not, it's not a patchy burn by any means. And then we removed all the vegetation. And in both of those two areas where we did treatment, we did, in part of those, we tilled, we contour tilled the soil afterwards because there had been evidence that that really helped to minimize sediment erosion or movement, and it broke up that hydroscopic layer and allowed the water to better uh, get into the soil. So, so we did some where we did that tilling, and we did some where we didn't. And uh, I won't give you all the results, we don't have enough time, and it's gonna be in publication with Lee and Cajun, but what we found where we did no treatments, uh, and, we, and we had, back up, two rain events, a one inch, uh, rain event, and then just a few days later, a 12-inch rain, which is almost a 30-year storm. We got 12 inches in about 36 hours. So, so th therefore, we had a lot of sediment movement. Where we did no treatments at all, we had on average about uh, six tons to the acre of sediment move based on the traps and extrapolating that to an area. And uh, the re and how you get at that is it's really romantic work. You get a shovel and you muck the stuff out, which is about this deep and it weighs and you put it on a scale and you weigh it and then you adjust it for dry weight and all that. So six tons per acre on the area where we did the, the uh, harvesting and no tilling, uh, we got about one and a half tons per acre. On the area where we tilled, we got about uh, uh, 0.3 to 0.5 tons per acre of sediment. So the, the sediment transport on the control where we didn't do any of this tilling was way in excess of where we did. And you can't do that on steep ground, you know, it's infeasible and there's a lot of restrictions, but, it, but it's one way of actively, if you can get there quick before the rains or you get big rains, that you can minimize uh, sediment transport down into the streams. And it, it's not easy, but it's, a, like I said, it's, that's one new uh, thing we've been working on recently. The other interesting thing that we're looking for an aquatic biologist or hydrologist to help figure out so when you analyze what did run off, almost 40, over 40% 40 is organic matter. It's not soil. And there's some implications then for transporting that organic matter into the stream system, which may actually be beneficial for hardwood regrowth, may, may or may not affect you know, long-term uh, macroinvertebrates and fish in the stream. But we're not smart enough to figure that out, and we don't have that particular expertise. So if any of you know somebody or, you, or, or, or there's a grad student research project or some advice, we'd be interested in hearing from people about how to think about that particular fact. So uh, on, the, on the Ponderosa fire, that's one thing. Uh, let me make some general observations here. One thing I don't see in the assessment so far and that we're uh, really pretty interested in is a, a discussion of carbon and the carbon storage cycle and sequestration and the role national forests play in that. And it's a complicated role and you can, one simplistic way to look at it is well, they're growing more all the time and they're storing a lot of carbon. And, and, and that's true. In fact, Bruce Goins, who works for the Forest Service, is, he's a smart guy and he's done some good work on that. And it's true that for the next four or five decades, because things are growing and you're not doing much treatment for you know, lots of good reasons, that those inventories are going to grow. But it's also true that based on even current fire uh, uh, frequencies and severities, that after the fifth decade, you're going to start a precipitous decline in carbon stocks in the national forest, and at the end of another four or five decades, you're gonna end up at a lower level of storage than you have right now. And so that needs to, I think, be discussed in terms of this overall planning process. When you look at carbon, and I'll just, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an equation that describes photosynthesis, and, and photosynthesis is, is a damn miracle. It really is a miracle. 
people have never been able to reproduce that kind of a process with a machine. And it, it takes six CO2 uh, uh, molecules, six water molecules. It uses sunlight as the energy source and the catalyst, which is amazing, photons. And it turns it into carbohydrate, which is wood, and oxygen, and it releases oxygen. And people all heard, heard that in high school, and it sounds you know, simple. One, it's not. If you look in Wikipedia, it takes 15 pages to describe just the chemical process that it is. It's not simple. But two, life as we know it on Earth wouldn't be here without that, that, those plants evolving that ability about three billion years ago. So it's really a big deal. Wood's 50% elemental carbon, usually. So I think that there's one thing that uh, could be discussed here. And if you look at uh, carbon, and you know, you know, stop me if I go too long here, but uh, if you look at carbon, there is what some people call good carbon, but, but, but we call it short-term carbon. There's carbon interchange in the ocean. The ocean is giving up a lot of carbon, but it's also absorbing a lot of carbon, and actually absorbing 93 billion metric tons a year versus giving up about 90. If they get more acidic, that reaction won't continue, and that's part of what they're worried about, is the ocean won't be as big a sink as it is now. Uh, the uh, re respiration, you all breathe out CO2, that's about uh, 55 billion metric tons a year, so that's a pretty good emitter. You're all contributing to the global warming problem. But plants and photosynthesis, that's about 110 billion metric tons a year. So that's a big deal, and, and th that's the biggest source of sequestering carbon we have. And then we have, uh, uh, there's also some that the ground itself just absorbs. So that's a, the anthropogenic cycle or the biogenic cycle, going round and round, atmosphere, dirt, oceans, whatever. That's not so bad, but what's bad is burning the fossil fuel that takes carbon that was sequestered millions of years ago and puts it in the atmosphere. That's, and, and that's what everybody's worried about. And we need to maintain the forest to keep that big thing to try to offset those emissions while we get on to other, maybe less, you know, uh, petroleum-based emissions. So I think there's a real opportunity for you to discuss that kind of thing. When we look at our own timberlands, if we make the investments in the intensive nature of managing it, which is about 60% of the land base for us will be intensively managed over the next 100 years, the way things are going. We're going to, uh, we're going to tr uh, triple the current inventory we have on the timberlands. We're going to raise the average diameter of the trees out there from 18 inches to 32 inches. And we're going we're gonna to quadruple with growth rates of the carbon uh, sequestration or storage on those lands. In addition to all the carbon that we sequester in the products that we cut, because wood lasts a long time and you can calculate all that stuff. So I think the Forest Service has a real role to play in carbon because they're the 800 pound gorilla in terms of land ownership for forests in California. So I think that there's an opportunity there to discuss that. Okay. That kind of Okay, sorry. One That's all right. Okay, can I say just one last thing? Yes, you may. All right, here's a book called The Rambunctious Garden, and uh, UC Berkeley is going to put a conference on along the lines of the concepts that are in this book. That, and let me just read this. It says, nature's almost everywhere, but wherever it is, there's one thing that nature is not, pristine. In 2011, there is no pristine wilderness on planet Earth. We've been changing the landscapes we inhabit for millennia, and these days our reach is truly global. If you inhale, that, that breath has 36% more molecules of CO2 than it had in 1750. There's no going back. Yellowstone moose are birthing calves by roads where human presence prohibits or protects them from bears. But soon, but more significant, are global phenomena like climate change, species movements, and large-scale transformations of land. We're already running the whole Earth, whether we admit it or not. To run it consciously and effectively, we must admit our role and even embrace it. We must temper our romantic notion of untrammeled wilderness and find room next to it for the more nuanced notion of a global, half-wild, rambunctious garden tended by us. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. We are covering carbon in our assessment, so you'll have to tell us if we're doing a complete job or not. And Bruce Goins and our uh, economist are working on that. Our next speaker is Pat Kidder who's one of his current important roles is uh, chair of the state California State Fire State Council Board, but he had a much longer history with fire, and he can mention that if he would like. Um, okay, he was the director of fire for BLM for a number of years in California. But anyway, I'm gonna let, with further ado, let Pat talk. Is this when you, can you hear me back there? All right, great. Uh, Talk a little bit about the California Fire Safe Council. The, I'll stand up 
because of my past experience as a school teacher. That way it makes it easier to get out the door in case you guys are after me. That's why I always thought when I was in the classroom anyway. But anyway, uh, the California Fire Safety Council, we do not have the relationship with local fire safety councils that the region has with the forest. We don't dictate to them in any way, shape, or form. We provide them funding opportunities, we give them some education, we provide conferences for them and things like that based on what they need. So we really serve them. With that in mind, we don't speak for the local fire safety councils, we speak with them. We feel like we're kind of in the same boat with them and we try to make their things happen the way they want them. They set up the agenda for us and we kind of follow through with that. The things that we do in the fire safe, state fire safety council are as a result of what the local fire safety councils have asked us to do. I'd like to thank Joanne and the Forest Service for this conference. It makes a lot of sense that they're doing this. Joanne was a board member on the California Fire State Council. We certainly miss her and would like to have her back. We get the Forest Service to fire her, we'll take her back in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think is going to happen. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the mission statement of the California Fire State Council. It goes like this, mobilizing Californians to protect their homes, communities, and environments from wildfire. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Local Fire State Councils like that kind of of information and language. Over the last 10 years, local fire safe councils, and again, I should point out, state fire safe councils, we don't do much work. Talk about shovels, we don't know where our shovel is. All the local fire safe councils have all the shovels and do, are doing all the work. Over the last 10 years, local fire safe councils in your state have done over 850 projects with federal funding from the Forest Service and the Interior Agencies over $83 million. And again, probably the important part is not so much the $83 million as the $70 million that those local fire safety councils contributed and matched. A significant contribution to what they were uh, wanted to do. Local fire safety councils do the on the ground work through a commitment of personal responsibility to make themselves safer from wildfires. You talk to local fire safe councils and I'm sure they're going to give you that kind of message. Local fire safe councils are made up of local fire management personnel, state fire management personnel, and federal fire management personnel from the different agencies, as well as a whole host of other stakeholders that are interested in making their community safe. How do local fire safe councils operate? Obviously somebody's got to tell them to do something. Well that was you guys as the federal agencies. In 2002, under the appropriation language of the National Fire Plan, you gave them direction and funding. You backed that up with the Healthy Forest Restoration Act in 2003. And then in 2009, and I'll short this up for the cohesive wildfire strategy, you again reinforce that again. You're the ones that are providing funding for them and the direction. And that direction comes in the form of this. We want local fire safety councils to do an assessment and then do a community wildfire protection plan. A community wildfire protection plan should have a list of projects that you want done within the next year. Those are the projects that come forward to, the, to us and that we try to fund. We probably only fund about 25% of all the projects that come in. We talked about 850 projects that had come into us. Well over 3,000 we received in that 10 year period. Those are on the ground, ready to go projects that local fire safety councils could have done. FEMA also likes what com the Community Wildfire Protection Plan because they put that into the county as well as state multi-hazard mitigation plan. I guess what I'm, excuse me, changing pages here. I guess what I would conclude is as you go through with your revision of your fire management plan, your local fire safe councils are a critical piece of information that can help you define your objectives and the things that you want to do. I do believe local fire safe councils have not only protecting homes, communities, but they're also reducing suppression costs, not only for the state, for local agencies, but for the federal agencies. You talk about fuel breaks, you talk about education, you talk about evacuation routes, local fire safe councils are doing a lot of this. Mitigation work done prior to a wildfire is the best way to prevent a fire and a catastrophic fire. Joanna's got a tight leash on me. There are several things that I can't talk about, 
but I'll leave you with some thoughts. We talk, when you talk about planning, we, it's kind of like the flat earth syndrome. You know, when you talk about planning for an agency, when you get to the end, edge of your lands, the world falls off to nothing. There are people just on the other side there. They need to be considered very appropriately for what's going on as you do your fire management plan. Not only non-federal lands, but also other federal agencies. SRA fees, I'm glad YG mentioned that. Contract stewardship, as you do your plans, contract stewardship should be considered. Sequestration, already mentioned, very nice. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Pat. Did I make it? You did, great. <laughs> you were faster. All right, our next speaker is Dave Sapsis, who's a senior fire scientist with uh, Brad, I'll let you say what that acronym means, Dave, um, for CAL FIRE, and if he's part of our interagency fire group, and if you don't like any of the fire behavior assessment that we're doing, we can blame it on Dave. <laughs> Just joking. He's a key, key part of that because we're trying to work together so that there's something similar with federal lands as with uh, FRAP. You're gonna sit there. Do you want me to use the? Uh, could, yeah, I was just gonna say that. You could use whatever. Would you like the lapel or this one? Um, I don't know. <laughs> just pretend you're a mom. Yeah. Yeah. This reminds me of the news. Oh? Yeah. This reminds me of the news guy on the phone. That was it on? Yeah. Reminds me of the news guy on the Simpsons. <laughs> What's his name? Uh, fire and resource assessment program. I won't. I won't pull out an old dead joke about FRAP. You guys can use your own imagination. Um, as Joanne mentioned, you know we, we're working collaboratively. Um, you know it's interesting. I think fire management policy in California has been pretty well articulated. That you know it's a fire prone landscape. We have a lot of fire. We have shifting fire regimes. From those that were native, and those are this is causing a bunch of disruption to natural ecosystems, and we've got burgeoning human ecosystems spreading themselves out throughout this fire-prone landscape, and really, you know, the appropriate fire regime for a house is null, and that's very, very difficult to get in fidelity with a landscape that has some endemic sort of fire regime, and then some natural agent of activity that wants to drive fire to occur and spread and re reoccur. Um, and finding commonality amongst those divergent kinds of impacts that fire drives is ultimately the, the biggest challenge that we're facing. And I think, even though I think science has done a pretty good job of articulating both you know, analytics that describe the problem, mitigation strategies that deal with it, it's still one of communication across a really broad um, set of partners to get, you know, agreement about an approach, to get enough agreement that then provides sufficient kinds of funding to do the kinds of levels of work that we envision. And as we emerge in the 21st century, we're looking at a lot more complicated kinds of features like climate change and the role of forest play as, as carbon sinks. Um, it, you know, it's patently obvious that we're mining stored carbon out of the ground. We're going to continue to do that likely for many, many decades at accelerated paces. If anybody's been watching, the, all of the new estimates for, for amounts of both natural gas and oil reserves are all increasing. What we thought was going to run out in 30 years is clearly not going to run out in 30 years. So the intractable issue of uh, basically pushing combusted stored carbon that was fixed through the magic of photosynthesis eons ago and just poof suddenly now is out there in the atmosphere um, is, is, is a definite challenge. And here we are in California really trying to manage really a remarkable environment that's, that's largely fire adapted. And it's also very, very well studied, pretty darn well understood. I don't know totally, although I've been, in the, I've been in the field about 25 years and I oftentimes think I've been manifestly unsuccessful at 
doing a good job, which would mean to me as an ecologist, managing fire in an ecologically sound fashion, getting folks to understand their role in their own risk assessment, and either living with that risk or, or at least doing whatever that they need to do to mitigate their impact on others. Um, and you know, nothing has changed too dramatically in that 25 years. And so I'm often, you know, relatively, I don't know, depressed might be too hard of a word, right? but um, you know, again, I think that the problems have been well articulated and, and well understood. Strategies to deal with them are pretty well laid out and yet we're still plodding along, probably losing traction overall with regard to the overall acceleration of the problem. And um, ultimately, I think that we need to look at our past approaches, which have been sort of, I don't know how, how to describe it. Um, I guess they haven't been too humanistic, maybe, because we haven't reached the core of people's understanding to really get them to act, even though in the face of solid evidence, uh, you know, we really should be able to make the case. And maybe that's making the case for more money to do the work that we think we do, we need to do. But clearly, the state, you know, we're treating 15 odd thousand acres a year uh, with regard to fuel treatments across a variety of different, roughly 15K a year across a variety of programs that I think YG probably addressed. We've got BTP, we've got forest improvement, uh, we've got urban forestry grants. You know, we're just really not making the kinds of advances that we need to get it in front of the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> Something Brockman, I think is it. Kent Brockman. Yeah. What's it? Kent Brockman. Kent Brockman. Kent Brockman. <laughs> yeah. so you, hold this. you just think you're in front of the news. <laughs> Um, I don't want to get too, you know, off track. Uh, you know, I, I think that that um, one thing that we're really trying to push is sort of more commonality, more uniformity, and agreement with regard to our analytic approach to problems in fire. And I welcome the collaboration that that Joanne is is facilitating with the state. I, I I've done ecological and fire assessments risk hazard and risk assessments for a long time. And it is remarkable how two different people with similar sorts of backgrounds addressing identical sorts of problems and nominally using the same sorts of building blocks build different analytical tools and different models that say different things because they use different definitions. If I say that the lower density limit for wildland urban interface is one house per 20 acres, and the University of Wisconsin says one house per 40 acres, suddenly, and you're using census block data to look at that distribution of wildland urban interface, you've got two dramatically different maps. And that does not help the public, it does not help us land managers to not have, you know, pretty much to be on the same page. And uh, I really think um, we're going to reach out in the, in the 2015 assessment. We're going to do much more focused kinds of research on, uh, on very, very specific, well-articulated problems like fire regime shifts in Southern California, um, wild inter inter interface definition and variability because, again, people in their minds tend to think that it's all one thing, whereas it actually spans a remote house out into the woods, all the way up to, you know, Mill Valley butting up against uh, Mount Tamalpais. So again, I think that at least one element that we can make some, some headway in is consistency of analytical approach, uniformity in definitions, and then, uh, you know, really being together um, with regard to problem definition, even though there might be different strategies based on, you know, organizational you know, issues, you know, Cal Fire manages fire on land that we do not own, so we've got, you know, certain kinds of, you know, dramatic restrictions, legal elements that come into play. But at least with regard to, you know, problem definition and description, I really want to see us do a better job of being consistent. Okay. Thank you, Dave. 
I'm not depressed because I taught junior high and high school kids and I got them to have higher test scores and behave better. <laughs> and I think the humanistic component that you're talking about is exactly right and I think everybody in this room here right now uh, share that interest in helping people to understand and you know we just need to try different ways and I agree with you Dave. So our next speaker is Sue Britty from Sierra Forest Legacy and we're going to go with the relaxed panel approach this afternoon that Dan started. They're going to hang out over there. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Sierra Forest Legacy is an organization that's a coalition of conservation organizations uh, interested in public land management, national forests in particular. And so we've been working for uh, several years, since 1996, um, and very much involved in trying to shape forest policy and planning. Um, and so earlier I made a comment this morning about uh, fire deficit, and so that's uh, the theme I just want to touch on here. And um, you know, the fire deficit, as I said before, is not one that ignores issues that we've all been talking about, the risk, the smoke, um, you know, assets that we don't want to be uh, affected by um, fire. Um, so we think a lot, and thought a lot in recent years about um, the nature of the deficit and how we might overcome some of the barriers. And so, you know, barriers being um, social, to resistance to not only smoke uh, but, and, and the risk, but also the look. And what is a, bur you know, a burned forest for many people is a tragic thing. And um, so the consequences of a burn force can be quite positive. So there's a lot of social issues in terms of uh, education and, and messaging. And, and I think we have talked a little bit about this is here. Um, I was starting to be a little depressed, Dave. <laughs> there, so I off. need to so toward the, uh, you. You know, the ladder, the two thirds of the way through the top. But um, I'm, I was struck this last year, last 18 months, um, about a presentation on risk and how people accommodate risk. And um, the example was coming from Australia, it, a, a, a society that has a very different impression about risk and fire and how they engage in managing that. And so I think maybe you know, that's one of our uh, areas for solution is to think about how other uh, communities and social systems have tried to take it head on and, and their very direct engagement is like what we see in the fire safe councils when they become very active in their, not just in their counties, but in their community. And the, the FireWise program being an example of how to get some of that attention and tune up for uh, a community about their role in, uh, in how they interact with their landscape and uh, in, in fire management and fire control. So I think there's some, some more things that we could um, accommodate there. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that, as an organization, we've been promoting as ways, as part of the solutions, okay? So we would like to see the fire deficit resolved. We'd like to see more managed fire. One of the barriers there is, um, you know, the, the, the in, in unwillingness to, accommodate, to, to introduce fire in some of our landscapes where we have higher levels of biomass. Okay? So, uh, setting aside what I might see in a more uh, remote and wildland setting, I'm with Joanne. I'd like to see people burning closer to their homes in a prescribed fire, in a, in a you know two foot one two foot flame length. You know, introducing that kind of managed fire, you know, within 200 feet of their home. I I would like to be able to see that happen. Um, and so, uh, tools that we need probably to get there and to get to that situation, we talked about earlier, biomass removal. How do we um, you know, create an infrastructure that allows us to remove biomass in a way that's economic, that's done in a way that's ecologically sustainable, attending to those um, creatures and organisms that use some of that structure, so it doesn't have to be removed 100%. Uh, and so our interest in trying to um, provide some solutions for that uh, part of the problem is why we worked with others to start the biomass working group. So that's a, a group of stakeholders that have been coming together for several, couple of years now 
very regularly to try to address how do we do two things, figure out how to remove biomass as well as um, take actions that might support some economic activity in smaller communities. So very much focused in that venue on um, the, the small facilities, the, the, the three megawatt and smaller biomass facilities, and so that's a, a, a big component of Craig Thomas's work for Sierra Force Legacy is um, working in that venue, multiple stakeholders, uh, multiple ownerships, all of those things being very important and good to hear that as, as people are commenting on the panel. So that's one thing. Um, another issue that we've been trying to tackle is um, the regulatory environment around smoke management and air quality. It's very important if you have sensitive targets, if you're you have the six-year-old child with asthma, it is essential to their life and their, and their health. And so um, we need to be able to figure out ways to have a balance of, um, you know, the times when we can have smoke and manage smoke and times when we need to know that it's to be shut down. Um, the system of regulations around air quality are complicated, involving many agencies. Uh, one of the actions that we took uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I guess, is to, um, we started in the Southern Sierra because uh, in the Southern Sierra Nevada, we actually have some very good opportunities for um, implementing uh, burns and wanted to take advantage of the expertise that's down there. Joanne mentioned earlier a concern about the loss of skilled burners and those people who know how to manage those landscapes and we're really lucky in the Southern Sierra to have people like Brent Skaggs as well as Karen Ballard, others who know a lot about managing fire, managing burns. And so we held a, um, a prescribed or a, a, a smoke workshop uh, in the Southern Sierra, hosted that, had a good attendance from a variety of agencies and stakeholders including the air quality folks and spent time trying to come up with some, um, you know, common understanding of why the fire is important. Not that it it's, it's more important than, um, you know, meeting an air quality for an urban center, but that it's important ecologically for the forest. And we had um, managers, uh, air quality managers, come to that event and identify that they hadn't really understood the ecological benefit side of things. And so that was an important common learning environment. Um, an offshoot of that was um, agreement among the air quality folks, Forest Service, and our uh, others, stakeholders like ourselves, to actually undertake a large scale burn. And so that's something that is in uh, the planning stages now on the Sequoia National Forest, um, a burn that is hopefully going to span somewhere seven, 10,000 acres and something that is very much in the works now. And part of that was designed, that the intention there is to try to work through some of this air quality regulation framework and to see if, are there, are, you know, do we come up with barriers and then can we, do we need some higher level policy solution to those barriers? Or are those barriers ones of nuance that we can work through by having better relationships and uh, a more common understanding of some of the regulators. So that's uh, you know, to be determined. Um, and then I think I think that I think that pretty much covers some of the things that were uh, pretty active involved in. And I guess the last one would just be to emphasize the notion of public-private uh, collaboration, and that. Um, you know, I, I looked at the, at Joanne, you offered up two-thirds of the landscape you wanted to see treated, and, and I, you know, I toss around in my head, um, you know, I, I, I would like to be in a setting where for every acre of mechanical, we've got five acres of some kind of managed fire. And, and so trying to get to some, uh, something that's more about this disturbance cycle on the landscape that, that would normally operate, is going to take a lot of work with the public-private interface. And so I'll just close by saying that was one of the reasons why um, I decided to join the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection uh, and, and serve on that board, 
is uh, the opportunity to try to bridge some of the connections between different missions with uh, a board of forestry and a, and a public entity that manages for largely suppression purposes with a underpinning of um, you know, some other managed fire and a public land setting where we have more opportunities to not suppress but manage. Thank you, Sue. And the next final speaker is Sid Beckman. And Sid has taught me a lot about fire. He also used to work for me, but that's kind of like an oxymoron, because he didn't really. He's worked for the Forest Service for many years in fuels and fire, and now he's been working for the Park Service, and his current position is as, I'll probably get it wrong, but I'll try Sid. Uh, director of the fire director of the Western Region of the National Park Service. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, uh, I'm the Pacific West Region because uh, now we've combined the Pacific with the West. And interesting conversation. Where does the Park Service fall into this? We have about 26 uh, national parks in the state of California about 2.6 million acres, whole range from highly urbanized parks like Santa Monica Mountain, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, to uh, the largest wilderness in the lower 48, which is the Death Valley, which is well over uh, 2 million acres. And in that, we do a variety of uh, fire management treatments and programs. Uh, in the urbanized areas, we do a lot of assistance by hire. We don't have our own organization there, other than maybe an FMO. And essentially, we use places like Los Angeles County, Ventura County, to provide protection in uh, Santa Monica Mountains and 42 different fire departments in uh, the Bay Area network. And then, if you go to the other end of the spectrum of uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon, Yosemite National Park, we have our own organizations, and we move away from that very focused uh, fire protection that we have in our urbanized parks to uh, some of the historic and largest. Uh, natural fire programs in the United States. So we have this full spectrum. Uh, I've been at this game now for uh, basically 32 years. And only three years have I been a bureaucrat. And the rest of that I was an operator. And this conversation that I've heard today and all this information is part of a conversation that I've been part of for about 30 years. And whether we're talking about uh, managed lands on private property, are we talking about our neighbors at the Forest Service? The Park Service is this island of uh, specifically legislated pieces of property that were set aside uh, by the federal government for the use of the public. And they have their own enabling legislation. They have very specific uh, resource management, cultural and historical objectives, as well as their own general management plan and a unique fire management plan. Out of 26 of those parks, about 23 of our parks have a, some sort of fire management plan. So we're an island surrounded by many neighbors. And in the Sierras and the Southern Cascades, our neighbors mostly the Forest Service, and we butt up against some industrial lands. And in the Bay Area and Southern California, we work with a lot of conservancy organizations, but also just a lot of private single land ownership. So we kind of see the whole spectrum. And in every one of those places, we use a range of responses to fire as well as a range of treatments. If you go to the Bay Area, we do a lot of biomass utilization of eucalyptus where we're removing the bases that uh, have an a unwanted uh, component, not only from a natural resource standpoint, but also from a, a fuel standpoint, and to where we go up into the Sierras where we mostly lean on prescribed fire, but we do have mechanical treatments. We do in biomass removal and uh, last volcanic. So we have that full spectrum there. And we talked a lot today about risk and how we define risk. And as an operator, I was a well, type one bird boss. I ran around with Mr. Skaggs there quite a bit. I worked on the Stanislaw National Forest where we had a wildland fire use program under the old terminology. I was a incident commander of one of the last wildland fire use and management teams. And then the last few years I've been running around and I became uh, qualified as a uh, basically a national type 1 IC. And through that, this risk management, 
you watch the scale of, of doing something, whether it's on wildfire or with mechanical treatment. From what I did when I started 30 years ago, where risk management was, uh, do you think we can hold it, to a series of in-depth, computer-generated risk models and long, intense meetings to decide if we're going to do something. And over that time, we've seen, especially in, in California, things like prescribed fire, the scale, when we talk about scale, drop off. When we talk about mechanical treatment, we've seen that drop off. Because as a society, society we become more risk adverse. And if we're going to make this work, we have to convince the people that do things, and that's line officers, and that's burn bosses, that's FMOs, uh, make them feel comfortable with dealing with risk. So they can go out there and they can make decisions at the ground level where the dirt gets done, where the work gets done, which is in the dirt, uh, to do the things we want to do. Because I heard, uh, I just took a lot of notes today. Uh, you know, plotting along, pace and scale. Uh, we talk about uh, the dollars that came in from the National Fire Plan in 2001, a bipartisan effort uh, by Congress in which uh, they put billions of dollars into the system. And in the Park Service, we look at the statistics and even with the influx of money, our productivity nationally see about the same. So you can make the argument that money's not the answer. And we're finding out that we're going to get less money here pretty quickly. So I really think it lies in risk and people being willing to have these conversations, make sure that everyone is included in that conversation, and that we as public land managers constantly monitor, monitor what public expectation is. And the primary example I'll talk about that kind of came home this summer is the Reading Fire on Lassa Volcanic National Park, which started in July. It was a couple of acres for several days. The, the park did a very good job of planning about a 900-acre box, which they were going to keep it on one side of the highway, in between a lava cap and a trail. They brought in resources. They started to manage it. And the same event that pushed the Ponderosa fire came along, and that fire went to about 28,000 acres, of which 11,000 were on national forest, 75 acres were on private ground, and cost the taxpayers 18 million bucks. And a lot of scrutiny, and rightfully so. And that was our decision, and we need to stand up to that decision, and we need to learn from that decision. What I've learned is people with good intentions took a risk, and there was a negative outcome. And we learn from that negative outcome, and we try to improve our decision making at the ground level, so people will go out there and take risk. And whether that risk is through mechanical treatment, through prescribed fire, or managing wildland fire, until we, as managers, and the folks that we work with, can have these conversations, and then hand the baton off to people that do things, and get them to do the work, that's where we're going to start to be successful. Or we'll continue to worry about pace and scale, and we'll continue to plot along. Thank you. As I always said, I learned a lot. All right, now at this point in time, we're going to entertain questions from the uh, audience, and we're going to pass John Clark, our public affairs officer from the regional office, is going to walk around with the portable mic, and then the panel up here, we will pass along this other microphone. Please don't ask the question until you have the mic, because that way um, we can hear you on the camera. Do we have questions? There's a question. Hi, I'm Brian Burnett with the PRBO. Uh, so I, I live up in Chester uh, near all these you know, rain fire and such, the burnt moss on the rain fire is my good friend. Um, so I'm, in, I'm a wildlife ecologist and so I have this perspective of fire in the Sierra and its importance and its role. And then I see my community's response to these fires, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, it really seems to me, I mean, 
uh, when our local congressman is contacting the National Park to say, why did this happen to the Reading Fire? This is all bad. I, I, I don't necessarily agree that it was bad. $18 million is a lot of money. Um, but how do we get away from, from this perspective in our local communities that fire is bad, uh, regardless of, of how it happens, whether it does resource damage, recreational dollars lost, um, to explain to these local communities. It, it's just, I just don't see it changing, whether it be your local personnel. Who wants to take the heat from your local community and your, your neighbors to let these fires burn uh, unless we can change? You know, how's, how are we going to go about changing those opinions? It seems like we just haven't done... This room agrees a lot more about how we should have fire in the Sierra. But I can tell you these local communities are up in arms about these fires and just do not understand it. And that, that seems fundamental to the change in, in allowing fire to burn in the Sierras. I, I agree, and I'm going to give a quick answer and see what else. Um, that's why I'm very happy in my current job to be in a core team where I'm the ecologist and there's a social scientist, an economist, a writer-editor, and then we are supervised by a social scientist. Because the longer I work on this, um, you know, 25 years, the answer is with people and their perceptions. And, and I actually think that the local communities living in one are coming to understand that because they don't have a choice. And I believe that people are inherently visual. And I am trying to get the video that I've collected over the years out there because to me that was the aha moment. So I think there are ways and it's going to take time and it's going to take that effort. And we just give it lip service. We need to quit doing that. Just a thought for you on this. Um, YG, you know, I, I like his comment earlier today when he talks about, you know, the catastrophic fires, the one that burns your house. Uh, when I see fire management people come, and again, I've had a, a long history of fire too. When I see fire management people come, they always seem to come with an agenda, and so you kind of see through that a little bit. When ecologists come, they always seem to come with an agenda. A thought for you would be is, if you can get your local fire safe councils to tar start talking about the benefits of fire, I think you will go a long ways in having that level of communication within the community. I think that makes a lot of sense. I see for the first time in the grant applications that we're getting. We're starting to get a few of them that want to burn piles, and even a couple that want to do prescribed burning. So it is coming around, slowly, but it is coming around. But I do think that may be one of the answers that you're looking for. Yeah, I think it's surprising. Um, I was just uh, made aware of some research findings by a Forest Service research sociologist, Sarah McCaffrey, who I've gone to graduate school with. Um, and, you know, I think at the time, you know, I was a physical scientist and she was a, you know, a social scientist and I didn't think that highly of that discipline. And yet, th she's had really some remarkable uh, results in increasing communication and understanding with outreach. And, you know, the expectations of people are absolutely imperative. Expectations are the root of disappointment. Uh, you know, and if and I think that there's actually even a nexus here with Sue's comment about the cultural relationship to fire that exists down under. And you know, I've had conversations with Scott Stevens and Chris Dykus who have both done um, sabbaticals down under and made that same sort of linkage that uh, the Aussies never have the level of a fire protection system anywhere near what we built here. And so they're always sort of working with fire um, from a more constructive standpoint as opposed to an impressive sort of I'm just going to put it out kind of standpoint. I do think with increased communication and outreach we can really do a better job of getting the public more receptive to understanding fire. But it isn't telling the same story the same way we've been telling. Which is again, I just got myself depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, this is we struggle with this a lot because it's uh, you know it's a, it's one of educating your peers or your neighbors or your communities, 
And um, if you talk to people from different parts of the country, this is not, so we don't have to totally go to Australia. I know the folks in the Southeast are much more comfortable with smoke. Now they have a different setting, you know, granted they, they're, maybe their, um, uh, you know, their health, their, their safety risk is different, right? They have different topography there, they're burning in, often in flatter areas, but they're handling smoke. And so I, I think there's some lessons that we can take in terms of, um, you know, education and messaging from that, um, you know, very effective use of managed fire in and near communities for the smoke side of things. Um, but it is, it is really, um, I think, the point made about um, the, it being able to characterize the benefits. So, you know, every, every time we get these, uh, this run of fires, um, you know, connected with um, uh, 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 the lightning events, like we did, I think it was 07, where we had so much, oh wait, uh, we had such a smattering of lightning in the foothills below that there wasn't an ability to suppress everything. And in, in setting aside uh, some effects to communities and structures, there was lots of good from that fire. And the, what was unfortunate is that one didn't make hay of that event and the benefit. So that people could understand, as I sat in the place I was in Coloma and was smoked out for, several, you know, for 10 to 15 days, we had a lot of smoke. We, we need more of an engine to then say, but we have some benefits from this. And you're accruing benefits, you're gonna suffer here a little bit, but there are gonna be benefits down the road because of these various outcomes. So I think that uh, figuring out how to get agencies to come together and agree, here are the good parts, here are the things we're gonna to try to avoid in the future on managing fire, but, but really call up the benefits. Yes, here. Can you remember your question? I, th I think. I think so. <laughs> so uh, you know, we're, we're talking primarily by the bioregional assessment this morning. We're looking at that, and um, so that includes all the land of the region. And there's been a lot of obviously discussion of the the forest uh, service and other public lands, and also the WUI, but uh, not much has been said about other large scale private lands that are check and board and border a lot of the, the Forest Service land, both commercial and other large scale non-commercial. So when we're talking about putting fire back on the land, you know, desirable, low, low severity fires versus catastrophic, preventing that, um, you know, ecosystem health and all that. When it comes to converting the assessment into the forest plan revision, What's the relationship in, in Forest Service planning as it relates to the large scale private land in terms of you know, uh, landscape scale um, system protection and management? Uh, I think we're making some significant steps over the last around the plants 20 years ago where everything was assumed to be a white on the map and it was all devastated and there was no wildlife habitat and all the trees were gone and you know it was death and destruction. We're way past that now I think. But, uh, and I think the understanding of the issues that overlap, uh, all, both of us are, are becoming, are emerging more. And I think we're, we've been uh, uh, really promoting for the last year and a half with the Forest Service it started at the regional level, but now we're starting to move down to the forest and ranger. A, a, what the forest calls, forest service calls an all lands approach. And that to do, uh, because in areas where we both own significant acreage and watersheds, let's don't, uh, you know, put everything in a forest plan. That, that should be a generalized document that you tear off due to projects. But let's pick a few sample watersheds where the forest service is shown the track record being able to get things done. But let's bring in everybody. Let's bring the guys with the power lines that have infrastructure assets at risk that are a public benefit to power, water conveyance systems, state highways, county roads, uh, all of the people that have assets that could be at risk, particularly with regard to fire. And let's try to plan on a watershed basis through projects that we would both do, uh, the ability to minimize risk and, and try to get a handle on reducing the amount of just biomass that's out there. 
Now, we're just getting started with maybe picking some sample watersheds that would then start to do projects with, which have to go through NEPA and all of that. We do CEQA, they do NEPA. But, but, it, but if we can draw in the PG&Es and the El Dorado Irrigation Districts and the public and all the collaborators, we may be better off than, than uh, you know, sort of each doing our own thing because there are a lot of assets that are at risk out there. The Cleveland fire, which is up Highway 50 that burned in 93 is an example, we were very successful in, in, uh, in reforesting that. Now we have a sea of trees that are 20 years old. Roads are overgrown, there's a fire risk, particularly due to all of the recreation you know, traffic and all of that thing, but it also overlaps on foresters. Maybe we can do something there. So, but I think we're getting farther along. The issue, and then I'll shut up, that's really hard for the Forest Service. If you look at where they stand now in terms of vegetation, if you just look at the FIA plots, which are those, you know, very conservative, randomized plots, they, on the National Forest Lands in California, they have 900 million board feet, which is a lot of wood, of endemic mortality every year. 900 million board feet. They're also growing 2.3 billion board feet in addition to that. Their removals through biomass or vegetation treatment or, God forbid, cutting bigger merchantable trees is less than 10 times, or le is way less than 10% of that. So they're compounding in a bad way. And until we can get a handle on that, and of course we would argue that, you know, you ought to cut a few trees that can maybe pave the way for all the other stuff you want to do. Managers are going to be adverse to reintroducing fire across a large landscape when you have the thing set up so high with all that vegetation and all the risk. The, the, the other thing that would help, this is just a little corollary, then I'll shut up, is if Department of Justice or Forest Service or us view the neighbor starting a fire as suddenly a big windfall event financially, that's not so good. And you're exactly right about it. You have to stick up for those people that made those decisions. Assuming they weren't grossly negligent, the agency has to not retreat from them like they did in a couple of places in Oregon and left them out to dry, which would send a message to every fire boss in the whole country as to what's at risk, you personally. They need to stick up for them, and they need to then tell why we made the decision. Be transparent. Don't try to cover it up or don't say we were professional. You know, we're the professionals. You know, don't answer. So uh, there, there's a few things there that I think are positive that we're, I think, jointly working on. I, I, I talk too much. I don't need to offend. I think uh, one one thing that we're doing is the assessment incorporates all lands, and for fire, we're working together on the common definitions and tools, and then the social and economic covers all lands as well. And so we are looking at the economies, both at the local and beyond that. And even in the case of the, the Southern Sierra Nevada, international, the, the sequoias are an international drop. Now, one of the things coming from a local community myself in Quincy is I believe, Ryan, that we would have more buy-in on from the local communities and private land if we, you know, were working on things that employed local people. And it's not that that's not necessarily the only obligation, but it's a win-win situation. So people are going to be more open-minded to that. And then I, I totally agree with what Dan said there. That's a, an excellent thing. And I really appreciate you supporting the risk. Um, that, that's really, and I'm glad this is on video. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, message of the Forest Service. Uh, for example, in, in where I come from, in Nevada County, we just had a Board of Supervisors meeting where they turned down the MOU with the Forest Service because they were afraid the United Nations and Agenda 21 was going to come into the local area and take over everything. So they, turned, they didn't want to work with the Forest Service on that. They talked about, just like uh, you talked about from uh, SBI, about the fact how much is growing. Why don't we just cut down everything in the Forest Service? There's so much growing, that's all we need to do. But the Forest Service at the same time now has got the scientific synthesis, ecological restoration, talking about a completely different way of looking at the forest than that was looked at in the past. Now, how do you reconcile those so the local communities can understand the Forest Service message now and how it relates to how they're going to protect them from fire. I am not going to pretend to answer that question. I would leave that for the regional forester, the chief. 
But I think the fire safe councils are probably a good intermediator, intermediator there. But I, I cannot answer that question. That's a high level policy question. But I think if, you know, there's the Forester's MOU and you're right, everybody keeps worried. And all these processes, you know, what really matters is what happens on the ground. And that's all really I care about. I don't care about triple bottom line flow charts, really, when it gets down to them. What happened on the ground? How many acres did we do something on? But if, if, if SPI and the Forest Service and the Fire Safe Council and other groups came to that same body and said, look, here's a plan that's going to do some, some good work in minimizing the fire risks in Nevada City and Grass Valley area, and these are the specific areas we'd like to treat. We'll treat ours at Chalk Bluff, you treat yours next door. I think that would sell. But, I, but that's not usually, you know, we work in separate spheres all the time. But I think if we came together as a group and had, had built up ahead of time a coalition that had some con consensus and everybody was on the same page, I think you could sell it. It's just a lot of work. We did have a meeting just this week with Malcolm North from the Forest Service gave, gave his presentation. Joanne Drummond of the Fire Safe Council gave her presentation. And Steve Eubanks gave us a presentation on biomass to the Board of Supervisors sort of to override the previous meetings that they had. So that, that was a good way to do it, I think. There's another question in the back. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion today, and I think a great understanding in the last couple of years of the greater need for increased pace and scale treatments. Joanne, you mentioned a one-half to two-thirds of the landscape in Sierra as you'd like to see treated. So my question is, uh, both for the Forest Service and all of the agencies and groups represented on the panel, how seriously will we be able to, through the forest plan or other actions, be able to actually achieve that scale of treatment? That's up to you and the public. The forest plan is not about what the agency wants to do. It's what the public participation process. Now, having said that, we have people with widely divergent views about how much, what needs to be done, and how we do that. So I can't give you the direct answer there, but what I can tell you is that the, from the Washington office down, there, there is an understanding that our priority of ecological restoration or restoration Part of that is the pace and the scale. There's not a lot of extra money coming to do that. So there's different ways that people are approaching that. One that uh, George Gentry talked about this morning with the Placer County biomass plant. Um, I believe stewardship contracts are a way to go. Pat Kidder talked about the fire safe councils, partnering with um, agencies or, or interests such as uh, PG&E that have infrastructure. Uh, the CHIPS fire cost them a lot of money to put down that power line, those very high voltage ones, even for 15 minutes. So there's, there's got to be a way that we figure it out. I don't have all the answers, but you guys have to figure it out. It's, it's, it's all of our lands. It is not the agency's land. Um, the pace and scale is uh, obviously something, you know, it's a, a very lofty goal. One of those successes that has been occurring with uh, the RCRC and the Fire Safe Council in Trinity County is through, has been through contract stewardship. It has worked out real well. And so that, that is certainly one way. Um, I'm thinking about... Um you know, that are interested in seeing more managed fire. And um, just reflecting on the success of the um, workshop we had, the smoke workshop, which brought experts related to forest ecology to, to talk to experts about air quality issues and, and how that was, a, that's a different conversation than I as an advocate might have with either of those individuals. And so, that uh, more common learning experience about understanding the importance and value of pursuing some of these tools um, to achieve better benefits. I think that's a part, of, really a significant part of um, accomplishing more acres. And so 
uh, clarifying for people what the real benefits are uh, from the, 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 um, the treatments, whether they be mechanical or burning treatments. And um, I've thought a lot, um, been thinking about how um, some kind of perspective analysis that would be helpful to do to demonstrate how treatments, mechanical and uh, managed fire, can be used to protect assets. And so, it, it, especially when we're talking about this intermixed lands where we have um, timber or other public private assets mixed in with public assets, that being able to demonstrate the resiliency you can get from a, a manager, the national force, who may be better positioned to lose some of their asset to smoke, some of the fiber lost to scope, smoke, how that benefit of resiliency can accrue to adjacent lands. I think there's something in there in that um, uh, packaging of that information that is important to this conversation and um, scientists and experts are very credible um, you know, witnesses and testifiers for the public. And, and that helps give confidence and helps um, allow people to be willing to take a little more risk when they've been given confidence through um, inf the information they've received. So. One of our most recent successes goes with my good friend there, Brent Skaggs, in the uh, San Joaquin and, and the, the Southern Sierra piece there, where uh, you know some of the worst air quality in the United States. Yet it's where our biggest programs are. And we look at the two animal fires, the sheep and the lion. And uh, why those worked is one of the fortunate parts about the park service is scientists are embedded at the unit level. They work at the park. And uh, Lee Tarnay, air quality specialist, Yosemite is a big part of that. And he helps out up there, and then the folks down that actually work at Sequoia and Kings, Annie Esperanza and those folks. And so we have scientists embedded, and then we also have a communication education branch in fire management, which that's a full-time job in fire management. And what worked on the sheep and the lion fire was the sheep fire started on the park, and we gave it to Brent, and the following year, year after, the the lion fire started and he let it burn out to the park. And it was that joint venture where you had two land management agencies working together, had the science component, and were constantly doing the communication. And the communication didn't stop when the fire was out. We continued on and made presentations uh, at uh, the California Air Resources Board, on um, the sheep fire, we brought out Dar Mims, the head meteorologist, and you bring those people out and you share them that experience and you show them what the terrain looks like and you know you let them stand there in the smoke. And then the other part is that outreach, incentive folks knowing that smoke goes to the east side and Mammoth and that whole economy over there is based on blue skies and folks coming over there from the LA Basin. And, and telling that story and continuing to tell that story, success requires a lot of work. And it's a lot of work at the ground level. And, and that's where We've done our best in places where, really, from an air quality standpoint, the odds are against us down there. But we continue to do it because we have science, we have communication, and we have a willingness to work together. This ensures teamwork. We have to pass the mic. I'm going to repeat something I said this morning in regards to uh, pace and scale that is a little more specific. And Phil Bowden back there, the regional fuel specialist for the Forest Service, I didn't give him time this afternoon, but one of the things he's been very uh, working on that's very important is an idea of his that we look at fire management, be it prescribed burn or managed fire or when a wildfire occurs in terms of energy release component bins. And instead of looking, that tells going to tell you how intent, and not just how intense that fire is going to be, how explosive it's going to be, and what the fire effects are going to be. And 
we need to do a more careful job of not making that decision of this is a year to manage for fires or not at the Washington office level, at the state of California level, in Northern California or Southern California. What we really need to be able to do is expand our ability to take a look at the energy release component patterns on the Sequoia National Forest on the Kern Plateau compared to the west side where Lassa National Park is. All of these areas have different patterns of these things and we have to be able to utilize those times when we know those effects and behaviors are going to be ones that are acceptable in many different ways. Now how else do we increase the pace and the scale? I'm, I'm not a, a pie in the sky person, I'm a pragmatic person, but I set high expectations. That's why my students increase their behavior and their test scores. So my increased expectations are that we implement a set of fuel breaks, shaded fuel breaks, because that gives us a good place to anchor off of for large landscape prescribed fire or managed fire. And it does provide, um, you know, some ways of, of uh, achieving some mechanical treatment in areas that we have less controversy, they're less steep. And that we increase our burn capacity and probably our mechanical treatment capacity in the, the Forest Service. And what I mean by that is some would say that we have more risk adverse people, we have less people like Sid Beckman and Brent Skaggs around that can pull off all kinds of big burns and they, they'll take that risk. We need to have those people and reward them. Reward them for taking that risk, give them a bonus, a higher pay scale, and we need to have them dedicated as special units and that's what they do. Yeah, I'm not the first person to come up with this idea, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna champion it. And so, and you do have the same thing with uh, mechanical fuel treatments. We are losing that capacity for um, uh, inspectors out there. We're losing that, that uh, capacity for silviculturalists and, and uh, uh, fire man not fire management, timber management officers and have these folks that are available that, that are not in endless fire training that's important for safety, but they're specializing, they're available, and they can come when that ERC window is available, and they don't have other priorities. And those, those administrative costs are shared. So these are practical solutions in my opinion. I just have a question as far as uh, pace and scale and in relationship to um, the context of like, restrictive uh, land allocations such as wilderness, roadless, and that kind of thing and the proportions of that versus the proportions of um, allocations that are more uh, acceptable to different kinds of mechanical treatments and also the areas that have economical viability um, for mechanical treatment. Good points, and we have to consider those. Um, you know, Brent Skaggs can't put in roads in the wilderness. Sid Beckman can't put them in too much on the Park Service lands, and they're able to deal with that there. And uh, there's different communities that have a different um, interest in what kind of treatments occur there and capacity. So we have to be open to dealing with these. And that's why the, this current round of forest plan revision is more programmatic at the large scale. And then you get down to the specifics. When you're communicating with the public, you're dealing with the interested people and the needs and the mixture of land uh, ownerships in a particular area. So I can't give you one answer on that. So my question is about uh, some of these social components that are coming out that I think are really profound. And my question is about kind of where they hit in the forest planning process or even with the whole agency as a whole. So, uh, for instance, you know, if we're saying that so much of this has to do with uh, public perception of risk and also so much of this has to do with uh, interagency and interorganizations and interbusiness co cooperation, collaboration, uh, you know, the next point would say, okay, well, we, we should have more of that. We should have more outreach. We should have more facilitated collaboration. Um, so, but 
it just seems kind of awkward to have that in every single forest, or to have it recommended to be in every single forest plan, because it doesn't quite seem like the right scale. Yet we're not having a bioregional plan, and we're not, I don't know, is this something that could be pushed up to the national scale and say, you know, this might be something to think about? Um, you know, a rebranding of Smokey the Bear, <laughs> or something, you know, I don't know, I'm just seeing where, where does this whole social component and this collaborative component intersect with the forest planning process and, um, you know, and then also do the other people have perspectives on, on its importance, so thank you. Yeah, so we're having this panel today, we're videotaping it, and yesterday we had an interactive uh, worksheet on this, integrating the human, social, economic, and ecological aspects. And why that's significant is that's telling you right here and now that I'm listening to everything that's going on and I'm taking it back to the, the team that's writing the actual assessment for the bioregion next month. And that's even before the actual NEPA process occurs. Second of all, uh, I work with three social scientists. I am the only ecologist. We're putting our money where our mouth is. And part of our job is to look at the institutional capacity, look at the politics and government, look at our social interactions with other landowners, look at physical infrastructure. So we're going to be highlighting all those things. And if in the assessment, which I assume that it will come out, that these are a big part of the picture, I can guarantee you the Washington office is paying attention to us. The chief looks at our wiki. And congressional staffers look at our wiki and look at what we're coming up with. And I hope all these people are looking at the wiki, and you are too, or actually it's too long. Look at the 40-page assessment. So you're going to tell us, do we have it right or not? And hopefully this time we're listening. I think they need to advertise on Jersey Shore. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we're talking about. <laughs> One idea I've had looming around is that we really need a, a charismatic face of progressive fire management. Um, in my early career, I was lucky enough to um, be exposed to Harold Biswell, who was the Dean of Fire Ecology in California. And he was a remarkable guy. He was pretty elderly. But um, I distinctly remember him in his raspy voice saying, Hell! Fire is as natural as rain. And it just caught me. It was really a remarkable statement. And I had known that, I, you know, I knew that fire was a natural like, ecological force. But, you know, I, I'm hoping that, that, that there emerges some new person that come that just has a magical personality that can reach out to people and touch them and get them into the fold. Because, again, you know, our old tired messages, I think, are uh, you know just kind of glancing blows. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, I, it's interesting looking at this planning effort compared to previous ones. I think um, I, you know I give a lot of credit to the Forest Service in um, stepping out and uh, you know trying to create different spaces uh, for interaction, something like this. Uh, the Sierra Cascades Dialogue, which is an, uh, an open forum, um, the website and uh, you know wiki environments, they've attempted to host webinars. So I think all of those are, are some opportunities um, to help shape things differently in that they, um, you know, they're trying to be um, accessible to a variety of uh, ways people communicate. I think uh, there's also the opportunity just in that assessment process to make sure, as Joanne said, we have an opportunity to provide information and try to get the story right. Try to identify, you know, that, that we, as we have today, there are benefits and there are negatives to, you know, the fire and reintroducing fire and having a, a system that has maybe improved ecological integrity. And that, that's an opportunity to disclose that. So I think those are, really, um, you know, set some groundwork for then, um, you know, the future work. And so I see the forest plan itself is really um, a component of a larger sort of effort and planning effort that's, that there is some harmony about among many agencies um, 
you know, in, in, in the recent couple of years. We can see it when we think about uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service hosting the landscape conservation cooperatives. Coming at it from, uh, you know, a very much biodiversity direction, but addressing multiple ownerships and, and trying to, you know, come up with some um, approaches that would be suitable. <coughs> Um, so I, I think there, there are a number of those opportunities. I'm very encouraged to hear that um, the regional leadership has been engaging a variety of uh, the, the agencies at the leadership level about how to organize themselves and how not to be uh, overlapping and redundant in their efforts. So I was encouraged to hear that um, the leadership team had reached out to CAL FIRE and the assessment folks and trying to um, you know, come up with some harmony there in terms of working together. So I think those are all leading up to a way that um, you have a forum for talking about a common vision, but you also have tools that you're used commonly to try to achieve a vision. Well, thank you. I guess the last point would be you know, if we can maintain that era, um, era of dialogue after the planning effort's done, that'll be fantastic. So thank Continual. you. Yeah. Thank you.